Uh, hi, everyone. Um, we are starting the last part of the gravitational com component session, and our next speaker is Stephanie Hansen from NOC Southampton. So, have to you. Um, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure, actually, to be sat in a room where I feel like I'm in my home, my little community of people, which is really nice. So um, without further ado then, so we all know that the biological processes that are happening in the mesopelagic are absolutely critical to determining ocean carbon storage, although Judith told, told me yesterday that I'm misinterpreting <laughs> a little bit wrongly the numbers. But we do know um, that without the, modeling, without the biological carbon pump, that atmospheric CO2 would be 100. 100 ppm, not 200 ppm lower than it would otherwise be. Um, we do also know that the deeper that respiration occurs, it means the longer that carbon can be stored out of the atmosphere. So this respiration depth is really important. And the depth at which respiration occurs is set by two opposing rates, uh, transport of vert material vertically via sinking flux and also by vertical migrators and also respiration by microbes and zooplankton, which makes it sound really simple that there's just these two opposing forces that are setting um, respiration. So, of course, we know that that's not true. In reality, it's much more complicated. So we saw this yesterday, I think, Adrian showed it. Um, the complexity of all of the interacting processes that are happening that drive the efficiency of carbon storage plus the sparsity of observations results in significant knowledge gaps. So I'm just going to move the Zoom people out of the way because it's quite I'm seeing their little faces <laughs> down here on the screen. Okay. Um, so we've got significant knowledge gaps, and we end up with this situation where the feedback between what's happening in the mesopelagic and POC flux, carbon storage, and hence atmospheric CO2 could be either positive or negative. And there's big uncertainty about the direction of change in several key processes, some of which we're discussing during this week. And this uncertainty was summarized in the IPCC AR6 report, where they stated that there was high confidence that feedbacks to climate will arise um, from alterations to the biological carbon pump magnitude and efficiency, but there's low confidence in exactly how that's going to work. The magnitude or even the sign of these feedbacks are unknown. So as a consequence of all this uncertainty, climate models vary massively in their parameterization of the processes that are responsible for particle formation and remineralization. And this results in high uncertainty in future projections of transfer efficiency, although most models, as you can see here, are actually predicting a decline in transfer efficiency by 2100. Um, and that implies a weakening biological carbon pump which would establish a potential positive climate feedback that would amplify climate change if this was the case. So let's take a step back from what the models project and think about how we, as biogeochemical um, people interested in the twilight zone, how we would expect climate change to affect the biological carbon pump. So back to this diagram. So there's lots of different things going on here. I should say, sorry, I'm using BCP, biological carbon pump, as shorthand for gravitational carbon pump here. Apologies for that. Um, and I show you this complex diagram here, not because I'm going to talk you through all the different elements in it, but to highlight the many components and interactions in here that could be changing in response to climate change. And we think that these things will change because we have a solid theoretical understanding. Um, it could be on the basis of observational evidence or experimental evidence. So just to, uh, to circle back to what Judith was saying yesterday, we think that the biological carbon pump can change in response to climate change, but at the moment, the biological carbon pump is not taking up anthropogenic CO2. This is a diagram actually from the last IPCC report, no, the fourth IPCC report, but these numbers for the biological carbon pump haven't really changed. The red arrows and red numbers are the anthropogenic stocks and fluxes. And you can see in this red circle is um, the biological carbon pump, and there are no red, red arrows or red numbers on that box. And that's because the biological carbon pump isn't doing anything <laughs> to ameliorate anthropogenic CO2. Um, and uh, some people, um, in, when they're undergraduates, say to me, but how can the phytoplankton distinguish between anthropogenic CO2 
And <laughs> natural theatre, no, that, that, that's not what it means. What it actually means is um, that the biological carbon pump is in steady state on these long climate timescales. Um, so the amount of CO2 taken up and stored by the biological carbon pump is balanced by um, an equally large upward transport. So assuming this, that the biological carbon pump isn't doing anything at the moment for anthropogenic CO2, what makes us think that it will change in the future and that this balance will actually alter? We think it might change in the future because we know it's changed in the past. And I'm talking about paleo timescales here, so, so way back in the past. So ultimately, on these long climate timescales, you have to change the balance between the downward and upward transport um, of dissolved in organic carbon. And there's a few ways that that could have happened in the past and could potentially happen in the future as well. One of those is the circulation, so changes to the large-scale circulation affecting nutrient upwelling and sequestration pathways. The mixed layer environment could change, the stratification might change again, nutrient supply, light availability. Um, we could have changes to nutrient inventories through supply of additional uh, nitrogen through nitrogen fixation or iron. Um, and temperature can also affect metabolic rates of biological processes, such as uh, growth rate of phytoplankton or, or respiration. So if we look at some evidence from the paleo record, it's really quite strong that the biological carbon pump has changed in the past, and it does have a feedback to climate. So um, at the top, we've got in the blue lines, the top two panels, that's an indication of increased dust supply from uh, desertification um, of the larger areas of the Earth's surface. And it's not only an increase in the amount of dust being deposited, but the bioavailability of the iron in that dust increased in this period. The green line is a proxy for primary production. And the purple line um, gives you the change in atmospheric CO2 concentration. So you can see very clearly the increased bioavailability of iron and dust falling into the ocean, increased plant production, and decreased atmospheric CO2 by around 100 ppm, which matches with what Judith was saying yesterday as a potential change. So it happened um, in the past, and modeling um, evidence backs that up. So this is an example where they've um, used a model which has temperature dependency of nutrient uptake rates. So that's changing the organic matter export. And there's also temperature dependency of the remineralization rate. So temperature increases, increasing temperature increases the nutrient uptake. So export increases in warmer periods like the Eocene. But it also um, increases the transfer, uh, increases mesoplagic remineralization and decreases the transfer efficiency because temperature speeds up um, microbial respiration in the interior. So we know then that the biological carbon pump magnitude and efficiency has changed in response to climatic variability in the past, and, and it's fed back onto climate and atmospheric CO2. So it's important that we try and understand future trends and feedbacks. So we're going to want robust estimates of how the carbon pump will change in the future. But unfortunately, our current suite of models um, do not give us a lot of certainty. So this is from the CMIP-6. Archive. So this is the, the most recent version of the archive used to um, drive the IPCC report. And top left, you've got primary production, you've got export at 100 meters in the top right, and then flux at 1,000 meters and transfer efficiency. And primary production could go up or down according to these models. There's a huge range, as you can see, in the different models. But most of the models are showing a decline in export. There are some which show an increase, but mostly they're showing a decline. And what that tells me is that all of these models are doing something different in how they represent export. Because otherwise, you'd expect that models that um, show increased primary production, all of those models would also show increased export production, for example, and, and vice versa. So you'd have two clusters um, of models, ones which show an increase and ones which show a decrease. But you don't. Some models have an increase in primary production and an increase in export. Some have an increase in primary production and a decrease in export, and every possible combination you can think of. So all of the models are doing something different. So why, why is that? Well, we know from the talks um, just in the last day that there's a huge diversity of processes occurring in the mesoplagic, and the models uh, choose what they include and what they don't include. And there's also differences in how the, uh, the processes they do include are parameterized. So there's a lot of variability between the different models. Now, we know we can't include absolutely everything in a model, especially not these kind of Earth system models, which are run for multiple simulations, like for the IPCC assessment. So how do we decide what is important enough to include in a climate model? 
Um, and I'd suggest that we should focus our efforts on things that are significant contributors to export flux and its climate feedback. Obviously, this, you know, what, what is important would change depending on your perspective, but from my perspective, it would be something that contributes significantly to export flux or climate feedback. Something that has the potential for enough observation so that we can actually develop new parameterizations and then test our models and validate them and so on. Um, something that's computationally tractable. So um, these models, uh, climate models, are already really, really complex and take forever to run, computationally speaking. So adding in loads of new processes, you know, loads of new equations, effectively, is not necessarily tractable. Um, and finally, that processes are relevant on the centennial and global scale of climate models. Um, however, even if we've got sufficient data to build, you know, really parsimonious and and mechanistic parameterization of every possible process we'd want to include, we'd have to be a bit selective because of computational constraints. So one way to think about what's important enough <laughs> would be um, an, an assessment of our current knowledge gap. And this is something that we did um, in a project that's just finished recently as part of the Biocarbon program. Um, Biocarbon is a UK program funded by the Natural Environment Research Council which span up um, last year. Adrian is a program champion. Um, and I'm going to give some highlights from things that have been happening um, uh, in my group on biocarbon. So we'll come back to it again. But one of the things that we did in the very first phase, I thought this was um, quite revolutionary for the UK funding system, was they funded a gap analysis and also some data synthesis activities before funding the fieldwork, which is really nice. Because um, you don't often get money to do you know, gap analyses and data synthesis. So that was, that was really good. So what we did was um, we went away and looked at the literature to try and identify major gaps in mesopelagic respiration. We were also tasked with looking at primary production and at biological contributions to alkalinity as well, but I'll only tell, talk about the respiration here for obvious reasons. Um, and we were asked to rank the, those knowledge gaps in some way. And we used both the, the team that were involved in the project to do an expert assessment, but we also did a community survey as well, which some of you might have received um, and filled in to try and broaden out perspectives. Um, and here I'm just going to tell you about the expert assessment because we don't have time to go through everything. So. And finally, we were asked then to use that evidence to inform the future proposals. So the framework is this paper, um, which came out a couple of years ago. In this paper, we were just looking at export. So we've expanded that um, to a broader scope and incorporating community input as well as just the, the authors. I'm not going to go into all of the details because um, there's lots. <laughs> and you can look at this website here, biocarbon.ac.uk, and there's a report um, from this project up there which gives all, all the information, basically. So what did we come up with in terms of um, remineralization, which was our highest priority processes? There's the list there, the ones that are high importance and still have uncertainty around them. Um, I should say the particle characteristics, what we meant by that was things like size, shape, density, and so on. And particle type is things like, is it a fecal pellet or is it an aggregate, that kind of thing. And what we were interested in was, um, I mean, the reason I'm not showing you this, by the way, is because the evidence tables that we assembled is like 33 pages long just for this topic. And there were two other topics. So for obvious reasons, you know, you, you can go and knock yourself out reading endless. Anyway, um, so and then we looked at the models because we were interested in knowing, well, which models do include these processes and which don't? Um, and some, some of the processes, there's lots of models are including them in some way or other. Um, and other processes, they're barely being included at all. Um, biotic fragmentation is really interesting, for example, because there's increasing observational evidence that actually it could be a really important process. Um, but at the moment, just one of the uh, CMIP6 models included it. So why don't all of the models include all of these processes? Well, uh, partly it's because the importance of these processes to carbon storage and climate feedback hasn't necessarily been demonstrated. But also, you can't refine models in a data vacuum. So <laughs> a lot of the time for these processes, there's just not an awful lot of data out there. So data from a single cruise, um, unfortunately, is rarely sufficient um, when people are thinking about how to um, develop their models. And I've got a real bugbear, the last sentence of a paper where someone's been out and measured something really cool. And at the end of the paper, they say, and this process should be included in every climate model. 
you're like, okay, well, that, yes, um, okay, but that's one data point, one place and one time, and it's a really nice data set, but it's going to have to be a little bit more convincing than that for a modeler to change their entire code to incorporate this new process. So, um, you know, we get detailed process information from one cruise, but, you know, we need, we need to show that things are ubiquitous or important enough to include them in climate models. So ideally, you want information on these big space and time scales to develop parameterizations and validate the output. And that's where um, scaling up comes in. Um, I don't know why it's got two question marks there. That's meant to just be another bullet point. Uh, scaling up isn't a question. Um, <laughs> Uh, so well, how can we get from these few samples that we take on cruises, or maybe we can you know, synthesize together some data from different cruises that have happened, but how can we scale up to get this seasonal coverage in global? Um, well, we can use things like autonomy, hopefully, satellite data, data synthesis, maybe we can use machine learning. So I'm just going to show some examples of, of things that have been going on lately. So here's one example um, where gliders can give you really high resolution data, of export fluxes and transfer efficiency over several months in, in this is South Georgia. So gliders are great for getting really high resolution at localized places. Nathan's been doing some amazing work with the BioArgo data set, you know, expanding the, the spatial coverage and seasonal coverage. Again, this is a biocarbon project. You can read more at that link. And Daniel has been doing some work that I really admire where he's been taking the UVP data set and applying machine learning to sort of, you know, make these global scale estimates of the POC flux and the, the particle size, which is really nice. So for all of these examples, increasing the scale of observations is really key. Um, and to do that, we need data synthesis. So just another plug for biocarbon. Um, Adrian's paying me by the plug, so that's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we started with data synthesis. A fieldwork phase is coming up. Um, they're putting three big projects onto one ship, which is interesting. Uh, and we'll be going to the Iceland Basin, hopefully in late spring next year. Um, and critically, part of these projects, of all of these projects, is to combine the information that we're getting from the field work with existing larger scale data sets um, to feed into future model um, efforts. So um, I'm just going to talk about but. <laughs> So that's very exciting that we're going to be doing that. But even if we can do the scaling up and data synthesis and so on, observational constraints are still, in some cases, quite weak. So going back to this data set, oh, sorry, it's not data set, it's model, it's model output. These are the CMIP-6 models projections of export flux out to 2100. And if we take a look at these, you can see there's a massive variation. So are some of these models more trustworthy than others? Are they better than others? Well, one way to try and assess that could be to see if any of them do a really good job at reproducing the current day observations. That would be a place to start. That would be a constraint. Um, and we saw yesterday in Chloe's talk, there's several of these global scale um, uh, syntheses. And the range of export estimates from those are between about 5 and 12 gigatons of carbon per year, as we, as we saw yesterday. Now, if you take a look at the pre-industrial values in the model, so before, you know, 1950, Ish. The range in the model is between 5 and 12 gigatons of carbon a year, and the observational range is between 5 and 12 gigatons of carbon a year. So the observations are telling us absolutely nothing about which of these models is better than another one. Okay, so that's one of the problems that we're facing, is that they don't provide a constraint because there's so much uncertainty in the observations. So, and recent research that we've been doing suggests that this could be influenced, at least in part, by the nature of our shipboard observations of flux. So we go out to sea, and we take observations all over the place, and someone like Colleen um, puts a lot of effort into collating them all together into these amazing data syntheses. And here's an example um, from Colleen's paper a few years ago, which already been uh, superseded by some other data sets. And you can see, it's, uh, first of all, it's kind of sparse. There's parts of the ocean where we just haven't sampled anything. I should say this is export flux from um, thorium measurements and sediment traps. So there's a large parts of the ocean where we just haven't got an awful lot of data at all. And it's also quite clumpy. So when we go to sea, you know, we tend to go do transects or we do process studies in a particular place, so it's quite clumped together. So what effect might that sparseness and clumpiness have on our estimates of export? One way of thinking about that is to subsample a model at the same times and places 
as the observational data set, and then compare the flux estimate um, derived from those, sorry, like this. Um, you know, we take all those the data points in the model, we find out what the export is in the model at those places, and we derive an empirical relationship, just as we would if we were doing this with um, satellite data, for example. We try and find an empirical relationship with temperature. In this case, it's primary production. So you can see you've got a nice relationship there. And then you use that relationship in exactly the same way as you would with satellite data and extrapolate out to the global scale. And this is the difference between the, the true model flux, so the full, the full model field, which you see in the colors there, and the estimate extrapolated from just the data points that we've pulled out of the model. Um, and this reconstructed flux is about 20% higher than the, the true model flux. So it's, it's a quite a big difference. It's 20% higher. It's quite a lot. So is it just the peculiarities of the data set that Colleen assembled that are driving this? Or is this more common um, when we take shipboard data syntheses? So if we use the statistical distribution of these data points in terms of where they, they fall in space and time, we can create simulated but realistic sampling patterns. So there's a simulated sampling, simulated sampling pattern, another simulated sampling pattern. So we're just creating patterns which look like they could be from chipboard data syntheses, but you know, sort of randomly spread around the oceans each time. And we use those to generate lots of simulated but realistic patterns. And then we can generate a distribution of the possible extrapolated global fluxes. So that's the same method as before. We pick out those points in the model, and we use the um, empirical relationship that we derived with time production and extrapolate it to global scale. The true value in the model is the red line. And so you can see the range that's being generated just by differences in how we sample the ocean is between 8 and 12 petagrams of carbon per year. So it's still a really big range. And it's, that's just driven by you know, the peculiarities of uh, how we do shipboard sampling, because it's fast and it's clumpy. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, we now don't just have shipboard observations. We also have autonomous observations, which could help as well to expand the data set. So for example, this is um, we could use Backscatter from BGC Argo. And these are the profiles, Backscatter profiles from 2022. So you can see that there's many more data, set, data points, of course. And they tend to be less clumpy than a shipboard data set. They're more evenly spread. So what happens if we subsample the model? Again, same way, subsample the model in all these places and then extrapolate um, back to the global scale. So the orange line is the number of Argo profiles, which of course has been increasing. Uh, Argo profiles with backscatter, I should say, has been increasing um, in the last few years. And the um, estimated export is on the, in the blue, and the true model value is the black dashed line there. So you can see that as the number of um, Argo backscatter profiles has increased above about 8,000 or so, that the estimated flux is sort of settling around the right value. It's still oscillating you know, year to year, but it's around the right value. That range um, there is about half a petagram of carbon per year, so much, much smaller than the range um, in the estimated fluxes from the, just from the purely shipboard um, data synthesis. So that's good, much tighter constraint on the contemporary flux. That's really good, really promising. But we still need better observational constraints, I say, because although that's really good, narrowing it down to 0.5, um, if we think then about what the future holds, okay? So the future over here, as projected by the models, the difference in flux by the end of the century is less than 0.5 for most of the models. About 70% of the models say it's going to be the change in export flux is going to be less than 0.5 petagrams of carbon per year. Now that poses a problem if, if this is, you know, if this is true, um, that the, the range in uh, export flux estimates generated purely by the interannual variability in our sampling patterns drives um, a change in export flux, which is less than uh, sorry, which is more than what we expect the climate-driven trend to be. I hope that kind of made sense. So detecting a climate change trend in export flux on these global scales could be challenging given the fluctuations that arise in flux purely from our sampling patterns. I should say that the model is, um, this is a climatological mean. There's no interannual variability in the model. 
So uh, all of the interannual variability you're seeing there, that range of 0.5 um, per year, is just down to the interannual variability in the sampling patterns where, where the model is being sampled. Um, right. So although <laughs> we might be a bit nervous that um, it's going to be difficult to detect a climate change-driven trend in the future, you know, that's not to say it's not, not worth doing, um, because we have all of these climate feedbacks. So there's lots of unknowns, loads of unknowns. So even when we know the direction of possible feedbacks, so we've got uh, positive on the top left and negative on the bottom left there, um, but even when we know the direction of change, the magnitude of that effect is usually unknown. And there are also a load of other feedbacks, as I mentioned earlier, where we're not even sure what the direction of that feedback is going to be. There's lots and lots of work still to do. As someone said yesterday, you know, we've got, still got another decade of work ahead of us, at least, which is good because we need the money, right? So we'll just keep going. Okay, so um, to summarize, so we expect that the gravitational carbon pump is going to change um, in the future in response to climate change, although we don't really understand yet how or why that's going to happen. Um, and there could potentially be feedbacks to climate. Um, the model projections are quite divergent at the moment, and I would argue that's partly due to poor process understanding. Perhaps that's driven by a lack of suitable observations from a relevant time and space scales. Um, and identifying climate-driven changes might be a bit challenging because we have these poor constraints on the, on the baseline. Um, and that's part of what this um, program is trying to do, right? Is trying to constrain the baseline of these different fluxes. And I think at the moment we're, we're kind of struggling a bit. Um, and there's large variability um, in fluxes as well on seasonal, you know, daily, weekly seasonal um, variability as well. And finally, just a plug to say that data sharing and synthesis is really, really essential. And without it, we wouldn't even have got this far. So please keep sharing. Thank you. Thank you for this um, amazing talk. Uh, any questions for Stephanie? Hi, thanks, Stephanie. This was really excellent. Um, I am so kind of inspired by the, the background of the biocarbon project and the idea that synthesis was put at the forefront. Um, I'm wondering if you or Adrian or somebody else could um, detail on what the process was for uh, getting that support for that kind of project. Yeah, Adrian's actually probably the best person um, to talk to that. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think it was there was an opportunity and, and we were given the chance to do that. I think it's fair to say in that... Um, when the funding council um, indicated that they would be amenable to a topic in that area, they were um, flexible in terms of how we planned it. Um, so I, I can't give you any sort of silver bullet, just the fact that I think early engagement with the funding agency seemed to give us a bit more flexibility in terms of how we're planning. That and the fact they were quite clear when they wanted the field work to take place. So that, that gave us a bit of a window as well. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I, I was wondering if you could catch us up a little, if, if you know, um, the changes, you know, using satellites to look at changes over time in primary production, since there's this, you know, nice relationship with primary production and export. Um, can you, do we know that well enough now to say um, there's been a change? So there's been some work published just in the last month or so um, by B.B. Kale, who's at NOC. Um, where instead of looking at ocean chlorophyll um, from the satellites, he instead was looking at the color. So the satellite chlorophyll is derived from multiple different wavelengths, um, and he was looking at the individual wavelengths to see if there was some change in the ratios of those different wavelengths. Um, Kelsey was involved as well, and me, so um, you can ask any of us. <laughs> um, and what that suggested was that there was a change in those ratios, so a change in the way that the ocean... That the, 
the, uh, the media all said, oh, the ocean's getting greener. Of course, you can't see it with your eye, but the satellites can detect that change in the, in the ratios. So we are seeing some changes like that, which might be indicative of some changes in community structure, for example. I haven't looked at the primary production um, products to see if there's any change. If, if you, Kel where's Kelsey? There she is. Have you looked at all, Kelsey, at the primary production products? Yeah, okay. Mike. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Toby Westbury just published a paper um, in, uh, oh crap, I don't remember that, uh, a review paper. It was part of the um, NASA special issue. And he did report, you know, the most up-to-date trends in primary production. Send me an email if you want to know the paper and I can find it. Scott, sorry. Oh, there you go, Debbie. Something's happening. <laughs> uh, I have a question here. Um, you know, I'm working on sort of climate policy modeling. My understanding is uh, export is different from uh, carbon sequestration. Yeah. So in the sequestration, we use something like two to six in the neighborhood of three or four gigatons. And then I've seen, you know, like uh, 10 gigaton, you know, on average in your presentations. I was wondering, um, when you talk about export, so those are from the euphotic zone to mesopelagic, where you know, how that is defined? Yeah, yeah. So um, for the model results that I showed, that's all at about 100 meters depth, um, because the, the models have fixed vertical resolutions. What you'd ideally do is take the export from the base of the euphotic zone or some, some seasonally variable, um, spatially variable um, parameter like that. But in the models, it has to be 100 meters. So just, that's just the way they're constructed. So everything I've showed is 100 meters. I haven't shown anything that is deeper than that. So it's not sequestration. It's the export. Yeah. And I think there might be a question online. Something's flashing at me anyway. And Ms. Larry Woodsall, I just want to be really clear. Maybe you can tell us all. At the beginning, you started showing those IPCC documents and the anthropogenic carbon. Everything's in steady state, so the biological carbon public doesn't matter. Everything I've seen in your talk and heard here says it's changing and in ways that move gigatons of carbon, more or less. So. Is that happening in future versions with those types of considerations? Will there at least be an arrow out with a question mark on it? <laughs> or will it still be ignored? Because I think by not having that in there, there's certainly not an emphasis on spending money on the biological carbon pump because of this setup in those types of diagrams. Yeah, so it, it, should, it should really have a question mark on there. Um, and in the text that I proceed from the IPCC report, you can see that it says, you know, high confidence that things are going to change but low confidence that we know how. Um, and so hopefully it's, it's in there in the text, but I agree when you're going to a funding agency or something, it's great, it's useful to have a great big red question mark over the bit that you're, you want to address, right? So, yeah. Yeah, because everything you've shown says that's not steady state, that's changing. Um, every model shows a change. Every model, every model shows a change. That Data is shows changes yes. in individual locations. Yes. We just can't put them but, together. Yeah, but what I haven't, been able to pull out of the model is that although there's a change in export, does that have a feedback on the climate? Does that change the uptake CO2? One yeah. would say maybe yes. So yeah, we probably, I mean, it probably does like logically we, we would say yes, right? So yeah. Okay, question from the virtual audience, um, Francisco. Excellent talk, Steph. Many thanks. Just a question. On top of the uncertainty related to what to include in the models, have you considered the uncertainty related to the computational structure itself, how the numerics is done and varies across the models? I'm mentioning this because fluxes aren't usually modeled quantities. They are diagnostic and as such would depend crucially on the discretion, discretization, discretization <laughs> grid, et cetera. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Francisco. That's a very Francisco type question. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so despite popular belief, I'm not actually a modeler. I just use model output as yet another data set. 
Um, and so I'm not really a best person to answer that question, but yeah, there are inherent um, structural uncertainties in the models as well, which are due to things like the grid. So these models are all quite coarse resolution. They're a one degree um, spatial grid, which you know we all know instinctively is pretty coarse when you're thinking about some of these processes. So yeah, so there will, there will be structural uncertainty in the models as well, but I'm not about that here. Any more questions? Hi, Stephanie. Uh, thank you for that. I have a quick question. You, your point about that plot where you showed the noise in the total export. So if I understand well, you're highlighting a, a signal to noise ratio where we, mm. uh, we can't pick up the changes that the model predicts because our noise is. But is it, you mentioned that it was internal viability that was larger than the trend we're trying to pick up in models. Is it actually internal viability or is it just uncertainty in our measurements? Because yeah. the models don't have that kind of noise levels, right? So are the models missing the internal viability and we pick it up in the data or our data is just uncertain? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So is it intranual variability in our sampling patterns that drives that sort of oscillation, which is what I ascribed it to in my talk? Or is it because actually the intranual variability in the fluxes are actually really that, that big, you know? And the models don't simulate that much. It's much, much smaller than that. And I, I don't think we know the answer to that yet, to be perfectly honest. Um, I mean, I guess if we, if we were really seeing a half a gigaton, car, a half a gigaton of carbon per year fluctuation in the amount of export, would we know? I don't know. Maybe we should start looking. Yeah, I don't know. Good question. Maybe a last one, because we are running out of time. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>